Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills Webinar, Understanding Your Fair Work Obligations. My name is Jeff and I'm an employee of Redback Conferencing and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. From her previous role as a Generalist Human Resource Manager for 170 staff, Karina has extensive experience in policy development and implementation, performance management, return to work coordination and strategy development for effective staff performance. Karina's expertise lays in the customer service industry with over 13 years experience throughout the restaurant, hospitality and licensed clubs industries. Her ability lies in being able to understand and relate to practical realities faced, facing small businesses in effectively managing their staff. I'll now hand you over to Corinne to begin. Thank you Jeff and good morning everyone and thank you for joining me for today's webinar. Um, thank you once again for that awesome introduction Jeff. Now, I am a field consultant for Employee Shore. So what that means is day in, day out, I'm visiting small business owners and managers such as yourself and looking at ways we can address compliance and best practice issues in your business. Now, the best way to look at Employee Shore is as your workplace relations specialist. So we handle both matters of human resources and work health and safety and are the one-stop shop for compliance under the Fair Work Act and under the Work Health and Safety Act. For the purpose of today's webinar, we're going to take an in-depth look into our fair work obligations to understand as a business owner what uh, rules apply to you and, and, and how we can better manage them. So, let's start from, from basics. Now, we have a very complicated workplace relations system here in Australia, which makes it very difficult for employers to understand. Generally what we see in our practice is that business owners become familiar with the employment relations system because something's gone wrong. Because you've had a disgruntled employee that's made a claim or potentially you've been audited by the Fair Work Ombudsman or someone's made an underpayment claim against the business. It is a very difficult system to navigate and that's why employee store exists to assist with this. So to start at the very bottom, we have our Fair Work Act of 2009. Now this act acts as an umbrella which provides a minimum safety net of entitlements for all employees. So this is covering things such as annual leave, sick leave and notice of termination. However, there are also 122 modern awards that sit underneath the act and regulate minimum conditions of employment in certain industries. So depending on the industry or the occupation you hire, that's going to determine what penalty rates apply, uh, what ordinary hours of work are, what minimum rates of pay are, which also have a significant effect on your business. And we've also got a whole raft of state-based legislation around work health and safety to comply with. So we want to look at how these three interact and what we can do to ensure our compliance. Now, under the Fair Work Act, we have the National Employment Standards which are these minimum key entitlements you can see on the screen now in front of you. Now some of these will look more familiar to you than others, but it's important that we have a look at a few in depth to understand what our obligations are as an employer. The first thing I want to point out to you in the bottom left corner is our Fair Work Information Statement. Now this is a document that not a lot of employers are familiar with. Essentially, it's a two-page fact sheet, a double-sided piece of paper that goes through these 10 minimum entitlements on the screen. We as an employer have an obligation to give this fact sheet to every single employee when they start working and also retain a record that we have done so. Now, if we fail to do so and are audited by the Fair Work Ombudsman, this can result in a $2,200 fine per person for which we haven't given this statement to. So as you can see here, there are a few bits and pieces here where we might not be familiar with that has really exposed our business to some risk already. Another one I want to point out to you is our compassionate leave on our left hand side. Now, people seem to be familiar with sick leave or personal carers leave as it's uh, today been commonly known as and rebranded as. But compassionate leave is actually an entitlement that sits separately to sick leave. 
Now, compassionate leave is applicable when a person, uh, sorry, an immediate family member, such as a spouse, de facto partner, child, grandparent, grandchild, sibling, or a child, parent, grandparent, or sibling of the employee's spouse or de facto partner, either dies or suffers a life-threatening illness and injury. And the entitlement there is two days per occasion. So the example I like to give as an employee myself is, heaven forbid, in a, in a horrible situation, my, my husband's grandfather has a stroke. In that situation, I would be entitled to two days paid compassionate leave. If, unfortunately, down the track, he doesn't make it and he passes away, I would then be entitled to another two days paid compassionate leave for the death of my husband's grandfather. Now, this is not a limited entitlement. This is per occasion, per family member. So in this situation, you could be paying nothing each year or you could be paying a lot depending on those circumstances. And this is separate to those 10 days paid sick leave. So it's important to be aware of this. If one of these situations happens, or an employee asks a question about their entitlement here. One thing as well that we have covered in this protection is our notice of termination and redundancy pay. So we as employers need to give an employee notice in accordance with these national minimum standards. Now, the most common notice you'll see is our, our table that represents a week's notice based on years of service. But there isn't actually anything governing how much notice an employee needs to give if they resign. So that's where we start to look at effective employment contracts and policy documentation to protect our business in that sense. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later on. Now, I mentioned before we're also dealing with other uh, legislation that we want to look at how this interacts. So on the bottom of our pyramid here, you can see our Fair Work Act. Now, as I mentioned, that has our 10, 10 minimum entitlements under the National Employment Standards, and it acts as that minimum safety net. So regardless of industry, regardless of classification, these basic protections apply to every employee. Moving up the table, we then have our modern awards. So as I mentioned, we have 120 modern awards based on both industry and or occupation. So in this, in this, in this instance, the, the industry rules and conditions that are going to cover someone, say, in the building and construction industry are going to be quite different to those working in the hospitality or fast food industry based on the way the industry operates. So I like to look at the modern awards as that goalpost of minimum minimal standards that we need to get between before building a more comprehensive framework for the business. That modern award always needs to act as the reference point. And if you're not referring to one or you're referring to the incorrect one, your whole framework is going to be flawed. So it's so important to get this right and the very first step. Now, on top of that, we have individual contracts of employment. And we will look in a little bit more depth why these are important. But essentially, we want to use that contract to cover issues that aren't otherwise covered in the Fair Work, Fair Work Act and Modern Award, and also add a little bit of protection for you. Things like what is the rules around intellectual property, around the dissemination of confidential information, you know, documenting all of these things to protect your business. Moving on now, I want to have a look at a few risks as employers should be aware of that we're seeing more and more come through the, the courts at the moment. So three key risks I want to touch on today are unfair dismissal, adverse action and discrimination, and bullying and harassment. Unfair dismissal is probably the most common of the three that you've heard of. Now, an, a dismissal of an employee will be deemed unfair unless there is a valid reason or is a genuine redundancy and a fair process has been followed. So what I want to do here is, is separate those two arms that we have. We've got two reasons why dismissal may be unfair. One, because the reason was harsh or unjust, 
or two because a fair process in the way that employee was terminated was not followed. And it's so important to make sure we tick off both of these boxes to protect yourself from unfair dismissal. One thing you'll notice in our definition here is that it's the reverse onus of proof, that guilty until proven innocent. An employee may be dismissed, they can go online to the Fair Work Commission, pay $86 and fill out a form online, and then it's up to you to prove that it was not unfair. And how do you do that? Documentation and proving those processes. Now jumping back in terms of unfair dismissal, there is a limited jurisdiction to the Fair Work Commission. So the employees that are able to apply for unfair dismissal are if you are a business owner with less than 15 employees, i.e. a small business, then an employee needs to have 12 months or more continuous service before making a claim for unfair dismissal. If you are a business with more than 15 employees, an employee needs to have six months continuous service or more before making a claim. Now, casual employees ordinarily do not have access to the Fair Work Commission jurisdiction for unfair dismissal. Having said that, if they are a regular and systematic casual, i.e. they've been on the books for a couple of months or a couple of years, they're regularly on your roster working similar days, similar hours, there is a genuine risk that they could be deemed a regular and systematic casual, and in which case they would be deemed a permanent employee that could access this realm. This is also the case for contractors, where you have an independent contractor who's not an employee, but again, if they look like an employee uh, in that they're, you're dictating their hours, you're dictating their uniform, you're supplying them tools, they're driving your vehicles, they're supervising your apprentices, they're completing work for the business as opposed to separate to the business, you know, again, there's a real risk that they could be covered here. Now, the jurisdiction of the Fair Work Commission only applies up to employees that earn under $142,000 per annum. So for any of those uh, senior level management roles that are earning in excess of $142,000, this protection does not apply to them. Now, to give you an example, jumping back to the reasons why dismissal might be considered unfair. As an example, we had a recent case in which a truck driver was terminated for urinating outside the entrance to a customer's warehouse. Now, although that is a valid reason for termination, the employee was awarded $16,000 because the employer terminated the employee without giving the employee an opportunity to respond to the allegations. And if they were to do so, they would have understood that this employee had diabetes, which means he suffered from urinary urgency. Now, whether or not that would have changed the employer's decision of whether or not they terminate, we'll never know. But the fact that he wasn't given an opportunity to respond in and of itself made this decision unfair and we saw this five-figure payout from that. So it's really important to make sure that we're documenting our processes and we're ticking all those boxes, which we'll look at shortly. Also keep in mind, we want to use probationary periods of employment wisely. We can set these probation periods for our permanent employers and look at it like a try before you buy. You know, during this period of time, they could be terminated for any reason. We also want to make sure we're giving continuous feedback to our employees. We don't want to wait for an annual appraisal to, to give someone all of their performance feedback. We want to address something as soon as it becomes an issue and note it and document it down. Moving on to the next, next risk that we face as business owners and something that I personally think is the scariest risk of them all is adverse action and discrimination. Now, I like to refer to this as the sleeping giant of the Fair Work Act because it not only protects employees and all employees, but also prospective employees and current employees. So an employee can still be employed by you and still working with you and put in one of these claims. So what is adverse action? Basically, you can't take any action to the detriment of an employee because of a prohibited ground. 
This includes termination, but it could also include a change of roster, cutting their hours, disciplinary action, even not giving them a pay rise, promotion or training opportunity. So the next question we want to look at is what is a prohibited ground? Now, this could be anything from uh, discrimination based on their personal attributes, so their, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, their religion. It could also be because they exercised a workplace right in that they raised a grievance, they questioned their pay slip, they made an underpayment claim, they submitted a workers' compensation claim. All of these reasons, we cannot take any action to the detriment of an employee. Now, the biggest issue with these claims is that, again, there's a reverse onus of proof. So you as an employer are basically guilty until proven innocent. So when an employee makes a claim like this, it's up to you as an employer to show that the action you took was not connected to that prohibited ground. So that if someone's had their roster cut, you need to show that it wasn't because they questioned their paces the week before. You know, it's a, it's a matter of making sure that we can provide evidence for this and documentation to protect ourselves here. In terms of penalties and remedies, the issue here is that compensation is uncapped. So it could be any amount of money awarded um, and you often have those no win, no fee solicitors will advertise, you know, trying to get clients that way. So again, for an employee, it's, it's no skin off their nose to make these claims, but it's going to cause a big headache for you if you don't have your housekeeping in order. For an example, in a recent case, an employee claims she was terminated because she made a bullying complaint. But because the employer could show records of meetings to discuss poor performance and that they had followed their comprehensive performance management process, the claim failed. So this is how we protect ourselves. The last risk we want to look at before looking at a good process is bullying and harassment. Now, it's estimated that the financial cost of bullying to Australian businesses is up to $13 billion per year. When we think about how widespread it is and how it can really affect the business in more ways than one. Now, bullying has always been protected under work health and safety legislation, but since 2014, workers are now able to make claims to the Fair Work Commission directly. It's easy to lodge a claim. The last time I checked the price, it was $67.20. And we're seeing a rise in claims, again, because this is becoming more and more accessible. So looking at bullying and harassment, there is a difference between the two types of behaviour. Now, bullying is where a person or a group of people repeatedly behave unreasonably towards a worker or a group of workers at work. And the problem here is we're saying the definition of at work, you know, where do our obligations there as an employer end? You know, we've seen bullying cases uh, where people have been contacted on social media outside of work hours on, on Facebook Messenger, but it's still considered at work when the employee was reading them at work. So these are the kinds of things we need to be concerned with. In terms of harassment, we're talking about unwelcome conduct that offends, humiliates, or intimidates a person or protected characteristics under anti-discrimination legislation, which is gender, race, ethnicity, disability, etc. The behaviour doesn't need to be repeated. It could be a one-off comment that offends or humiliates. It's really important that we have a comprehensive policy in place, not only because we're legally required to, but also to be able to prove a fair process and to have something in place that acts not only as, as a resource for the employee, but also for your frontline managers if you're a bigger business. You know, what, how, do they, how do they deal with these issues? They then have in that policy a go-to guide that they can look at and, and, and go through that process without causing any risk to the business. As I mentioned, it's really important to look at what that bullying conduct at work encompasses. So we're talking about both the performance of work, be it at any time or any location, 
and where the worker is engaged in some activity which is otherwise permitted by their employer. So social staff gatherings or staff parties, uh, internet usage during breaks at work, you know, these things are extended to be the definition of at work. Now, this is not to say that as an employer we, we never want to performance manage employees for the risk of a bullying claim made against yourselves. You know, but again, it's very important to be able to protect yourselves by spelling out what is bullying and what is not bullying. So in that instance, reasonable management action conducted in a reasonable manner is not bullying. And spelling that out to our employees so they understand if they might be a little bit too precious, for, for lack of a better word, you know, spelling out that what's happening right now is not bullying, that you're speaking to someone about genuine performance issues. Now, we've spoken a lot about the risks to the business, but how do we mitigate these risks? It's important to look at what a fair process is. So in an instance where we want to have a disciplinary meeting with an employee, we want to notify the employee that there's going to be a disciplinary meeting. So a notice of meeting letter that's going to spell out where the meeting is, when the meeting is, that the employee is welcome to bring a per support person of their choosing and items to be discussed, be it specific allegations of misconduct through to performance issues and KPIs that they're not hitting. We then want to give them the opportunity to respond. So it's no good turning up to a disciplinary meeting with a typed letter of termination ready to issue because you're not showing that what they had to say during that meeting was taken into consideration. So giving that, giving that person an opportunity to respond to the allegations or respond to the performance issues during the meeting to really get to the bottom of the issue and understand what is going to be a viable step moving forward in this performance management cycle. As I mentioned, we always want to allow the employee to bring a support person of their choice and it's really in your best interest to have them there so that they can't make a claim to say they were denied a support person. We did see this recently in the uh, Channel 7 case of, of harassment that was made that was really publicised last week and the main claim from the employee that she was not provided with a support person. So, you know, it's something that can bring people undone so quickly. and. In that instance, they are exactly that, they're a support person. They're not there to advocate on the employee's behalf. They're there to pause the meeting in case things get emotional. They're there to offer that support, but they're not there to run the meeting on their behalf. And I always recommend when we start the meeting, outlining those ground rules from the start. Now, depending on the reason for the disciplinary action, if we're talking about performance issues, we need to give the employee an opportunity to improve. So where the employee has failed to meet key performance indicators or failed to, to adhere to their job description, during that meeting we want to find out why, what's going wrong, do they need more tools, more resources, more training, and we want to give them time to, to be able to uh, address those performance issues. So if the issue is something simply as lateness, you know, that an employee is constantly late to work, we're only going to give them a week. You know, a week, maybe two, to, to be able to get their act together and get to work on time. But for the example of if you're in a real estate business and you're not meeting sales targets of properties, an employee is going to need eight to 12 weeks to be able to action that and see some improvement. So where we do set those measures for improvement, we really need to be providing reasonable timelines and considering what that is. In the instance of misconduct, so we're having a meeting for workplace violence or theft, you know, you don't necessarily need to give the employee an opportunity to respond, or sorry, an opportunity to improve. We, we no longer work on the, the three strikes and you're out rule. It's really based on the nature and the severity of the conduct. But we still do need to follow the steps preceding that. Now, I do want to change pace a little bit and look at our contracts and policies and why they're so important. Now, I'm preaching to the choir myself because my job day in, day out is writing employment contracts and policies for business. And what I see in them being so important overall for a business is it spells out exactly what's expected from employees. So our contracts from our a legally binding perspective. They're a bit of a set and forget unless they change classifications or 
their employment terms and conditions significant, very significantly. We're going to set them up and leave them there. So it's going to create certainty around what you are entitled to, what you aren't entitled to. Will you be paid annual leave loading for periods of annual leave? Will you be paid penalty rates? Um, all of these things we want to be covering off in our contract. It also means that we can set contractual obligations for the employee, saying that they must adhere to all policies and procedures as, as, as an expectation in their contract. You know, we want to be able to provide protection for yourself as employers, so spelling out clauses regarding post-termination restraints and non-solicitation clauses so your employees can't take clients with them. Setting up what, what a reason for someone being terminated might be. So you've already got the process to show that this is why you may be terminated, so the reason can't be considered harsh or unjust. Looking at things like confidential information, intellectual property, these are all the kinds of things we want to spell out in contracts. I also like to spell out in contracts what I would consider essential requirements of roles. So if you are a health practitioner, you must be registered through APRA and you must maintain that registration. So that to me is very important to put in a contract. If someone requires their car to travel to client sites, it's going to be very important that they maintain their driver's license, that they maintain their car that is insured. If they're working in the building and construction industry, they're going to need a white car. They may need working at height clearances, forklift clearances. These are all the kinds of things we want to spell out in the contract to put the obligation on the employee to maintain these qualifications. Because where they don't, this can impact the business as well. And, you know, if someone loses their license for drink driving and, and they need to get to client sites, that's going to put a burden on the business. So making sure we spell this out to protect you. In terms of policies, you know, this is where we look at setting and enforcing expectations. So, you know, spelling out everything from job description to how people are to request time off. Uh, to how people are to clock in and clock off every day at work is going to be so important and, and really take a lot of the headache out of managing staff for you. As small business owners, it's quite difficult because you're often there side by side, day in, day out with employees and, and you can't help but forge friendships with them. So it can be quite awkward to have those difficult conversations about meeting expectations. But when everything's written down in paper and black and white, to simply say, look, it's written here, it's black and white, you know, it makes it much easier to point out and to have that conversation because it takes the personal side and the emotional side out of it. And looking at a simple perspective of morale and, and productivity, I personally, as an employee, much prefer when I when I start a job and I'm given these documents because that way I know what's exactly expected of me. I don't have any questions or uncertainties lingering about well, what does my pay include and, and what exactly is expected of me you know, before termination is considered. So it definitely works in both ways here as well. In terms of looking at policies and contracts and, and what should be in each of them, I did touch in terms of looking at policies and contracts and, and what should be in each of them, I did touch on this before, but just to clarify, our contract is our legally binding terms and it, it, it is legally enforceable. So looking at those bare bones terms and conditions. So as an example, in a contract for a full-time employee, we might say you are entitled to four weeks annual leave in accordance with the Fair Work Act. The policy, however, on annual leave might say I need X amount of weeks notice before you take annual leave. Because our very busy times are during December, you can't ordinarily take leave before Christmas. Um, you need to make these requests and fill out a form before making any holiday arrangements like booking flights or, or accommodation. You know, spelling all of these things out would be in the policy side of things. So because the contract can't be amended without the employee consent, that's why we, we spell out the bare bones and leave it there. But the policy, they're your rules, they're your expectations, you can amend at any time. We simply just need to give them to the employee so that they can acknowledge that they've received a copy of that document and that uh, you can change it at, at any time. Um, 
Okie doke. One thing I like to also say is not to incorporate policies into contracts. And I see it so often with employers. They, they, they have a letter of offer that's kind of turned into an employment contract that also has a few policies regarding work health and safety and drugs and alcohol. The problem with that is when it's in the contract, it's legally binding. So something as simple as you saying you will be paid weekly on a Wednesday and you change the payroll day to Thursday, you've breached your contractual obligations as an employer. So it's really important to make sure we separate those two. Now, I've spoken to you about what you need and, and I hope I haven't overwhelmed you too much when we look at the basic framework for employment relations here. But to give you a little bit of idea of where I'm coming from and spelling all this out, this is what EmploySure does. We're essentially your HR managers. So myself or another field consultant would come out to your business, do a comprehensive review and gap analysis of where we're at. We would advise on things like award coverage. We would draft our comprehensive contracts in the way that you want your business run and a comprehensive employment handbook as well. So once you have that framework set up, you're on the track to success. But the best part I like about our service, um, even though I am a little bit biased, is our advice line. So we have a offices based in Sydney, Perth and New Zealand. And in those call centres, if you will, we have employment relations and work health and safety experts that are there to answer your calls 24-7, everything from I have a trainee or a new starter, I need to know the correct rate of pay to offer them under the relevant award. Through to you've had a customer complaint or an employee's made a complaint about bullying and you're not sure where to go from here. We can walk you through the, the investigation process and disciplinary process step by step. In the instance where you need to have a disciplinary meeting, we write the, no we not write the notice of meeting letter for you. We write the notice of termination letters for you. We do all of the correspondence for you. Pretty much everything through to job advertisements, recruitment questionnaires, through to performance management, performance improvement plans, commission schemes, everything you need for your business in terms of tools and documents, we can do for you. When you call our advice line and follow our advice, that's where our insurance package comes into it. So if we give you advice about terminating an employee, if you follow our advice and they still come back and make a claim against you, you are protected through QBE insurance and this is all included in our membership fee. Right or wrong, whether you follow our advice or not, we offer legal representation for every step of the process. So when we're talking about any kind of mediation through fair work, we have a claims team that will handle that for you. And when we're talking about going to court, we outsource to Spark Hill Law and this is at no cost to you as a business leader. So it's really important to get us on board for peace of mind and knowing that we're always there to help you uh, work through all of your compliance as a business. And this is for both HR and human, uh, sorry, human resources and work health and safety. So I hope that's given you a great overview and uh, I believe Jeff is going to jump in and help us facilitate a bit of a Q&A with any questions that you might have. Thanks, Corinne. So we do have some questions already. So just a reminder, everyone, if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat facility on the left-hand side of your screen. So the first question we have, is how binding is a probation period written into an employment contract? Yeah, very good question. So with the probation periods written into the employment contract, they are binding so long as they are compliant with what the law says. Now there's no black and white rule under the law regarding probation periods. You won't find that word mentioned in the legislation, but what you will find are those jurisdictional issues regarding unfair dismissal. So as I mentioned, a business with more than 15 employees, you've got to have six months service or more. For a business with less than 15 employees, you need to have 12 months service or more. So as long as your probation period is under those numbers for the size of your business, it will be compliant, it will be enforceable. My recommendation of what I personally like to include in, in client contracts is to say an option of three months uh, sorry, a, a probation period of three months with an option to extend. And the reason why I like to do that is it encourages proactive performance management before everyone's gotten a little bit too settled and a little bit too complacent. So you have that opportunity at three months to have a meeting and say, okay, I think you're doing 
excellently at ABC, but you need to improve on XYZ. I'm going to extend your probation period for four weeks and we'll review again then. In that situation, our clients are able to give us a call. We can write the letter for the probationary meeting. We can write the outcome letter for the probationary meeting. Uh, and email these to you to give to the client, to give to the employee. So again, every step of the process is covered. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Corinne. While we wait, you'll see the in-room survey pop up on the right-hand side of your screen. Please ensure you hit the orange submit button once you've completed the question. Our next question, can an employee's support person speak at a meeting on the employee's behalf? Look, it's a really tricky one there, and I would like to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I think depending on the nature of, of the issue that you're addressing um, and, and the employee themselves, what we often find is you know, claims about bullying or fair process is that a lot of it comes down to employee interpretation. You know, we're all speaking English, but the way I say something might be interpreted differently by someone else. So what we really need the employer to do is, is or employers to do is to set that safe space and explain that, you know, we're not here to reprimand you, we're here to get to the bottom of what's going on. Because ideally, and what I like to spell out during performance management meetings is no one's sitting here wanting someone to get fired. You know, it's a horrible thing to do as an employer. And you essentially want that employee to improve and to become that your star performer again. And it's a matter of spelling that out to the employer, saying this is a safe space, this is what we want to discuss, you need to help us help you, and how can we get through it? Now, in terms of a black and white rule of whether or not they can talk on their behalf, I, I unfortunately can't say yes or no. I'd really like to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is the kind of prep work that our advice line can do with someone. You know, we can talk in depth confidentially, confidentially about the person's personality traits against their claims, the, 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 the allegations made against them in a meeting through to, you know, what their previous history is. And we can work out a strategy there that's going to be specific to that set of circumstances. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Corinne. So just uh, if you do have any final questions, please type them in the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Wait a few moments to see if any come through. Thanks, Jeff. And one thing I want to point out as well is while I have given you a general overview today of the framework, as you can see, there are a lot of specific things that are important to a business. And if you would like one of our team members to get in touch with you to work out a, a time where we can come out and one-on-one -on -one speak to you obligation-free, uh, regarding your workplace compliance, just let us know in that survey on the on the right hand side of the screen, and I'll have a team member get in touch and we can work that out together. Well, Corinne, it appears as though we have no further questions coming through. So, did you have any closing remarks? Look, I just want to thank everyone for your time today. Um, I hope I haven't over overwhelmed you too much. Yes, we do have a complicated workplace relations framework. But it's understanding that there's a solution out there and that's exactly what we do day in, day out. So give us a call. Uh, give our advice line a call for anything we can help you with. Step by step, that's exactly what we're here for. So hopefully I've provided, uh, provided some light for you today on this issue and I really thank you for your attendance and listening in. Thanks, Corinne, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. We hope you gained some valuable insights and found the technology easy and engaging. Just a reminder that you will receive a copy of the webinar recording within 48 hours. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.